So, hello everybody and welcome to Norwich, welcome to the University of East Anglia and to a group of colleagues from the School of Education at UEA and we're delighted to welcome you here. We don't have two cameras as we'd hoped so I'm going to start by talking here and then people will come forward and present. We've also got some pre-recorded um, presentations as well. Anyway, I'm delighted to be able to host this event, which is a celebration of the publication of these two volumes, Senses of Focusing, which I've been engaged in working on with Nikos for the last two years or so. Here, um, Jan, welcome. Um, hello. Hello, hello. So this is Jan Lebeau, who is the head of the School of Education. Discreet entry. Thank you. Um, and it's actually, uh, and this is very timely now, because it's actually thanks to you that we're here. Um, because it is Jan who invited us to hold this event. And we are, we are so delighted because it feels like a real celebration of our work. Um, not, not just over the last two or three years, but actually over the last 30 years. Because today um, we worked out, or Brian said, <coughs> the Centre for Counselling Studies was actually founded 30 years ago in 1992. So it's very timely that we're here. And this feels like, you know, this feels like uh, the celebration of all that we've done, the culmination of all that we've done. Anyway, so we are recording this meeting and it will eventually go on the Census of Focusing website. My name is Judy Moore. I'm one of the co-editors of these two volumes. And um, I was formerly director of the Center of Counseling Studies. And I um, worked, worked here at UEA for many years. So Census of Focusing has been many things but above all, today we're here to celebrate the contribution of my colleagues here at UEA. So we've got staff, we've got former research students, and I'm just delighted that we've been asked to do this. I'm delighted that Esther um, has offered to host the chat, and she's been a real support of all, that, all of our endeavours. Um, so although UEA no longer runs counselling programmes or focusing programmes, we, over the last few years, we have had um, PhD students and a lot of their research has come to fruition in the last few years. And that is, when, when we decided to do these two volumes, I was delighted to be able to go to some of my colleagues here and ask if they would like to write a chapter. So we do have several um, several chapters which people are going to talk about today. So we've only got one and a half hours today and so we've got to keep to a really tight schedule. So some of the presentations have been pre-recorded, um, some of them will be live and you'll see as it kind of works, it, it will work out in a very obvious um, sequence. We have a wonderful technical person here, Renato Passato, who you can see just down in the corner. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we couldn't be here without him. And the other person that we wouldn't be here without is Nikos Kipriotakis, my wonderful, wonderful co-editor, um, without whom these volumes would never have happened. And because although this is primarily a UEA event, I really wanted to invite Nikos to speak. And so we have uh, Nikos pre-recorded from Athens, and we will come to him in due course. Um, because I, I've actually written quite a lot in these two volumes, principally three pieces, and in order to talk about them as briefly as possible, I have pre-recorded a short presentation on which we will, which we will play, uh, play shortly. So, but I just want to say something about the person-centred approach and focusing as UEA have been my professional families for a long time. 
and these volumes have grown out of this and we are very fortunate that we are we are actually able to celebrate um, a long a long history a long legacy and, and Brian Saul, Professor Brian Saul, who is sitting here, will say something about that. So the order we're going to do today is we'll, um, we'll have my short presentation, then we'll go to Brian, then we'll go to Campbell Curtin, who is sitting here, and then we will, we will move down the other presenters. So, celebrating 30 years of counselling training at UEA, um, some wonderful years we've had and we will have time for questions and comments at the end as long as we can keep moving. So uh, with no further ado, we'll just go into my two short, um, my, my short presentation. I just want to say something quickly about the three pieces that I wrote myself for um, the two volumes of Senses of Focusing, uh, apart from the more um, general pieces. Um, the first thing that I actually wrote was a chapter uh, which appears in volume two, which is about um, poetry and the physical nature of experiencing. And specifically, I also look at um, the work of Julian of Norwich and how the physicality of her experiencing relates to the spiritual opening that she experienced in her revelations. So that I did that quite quite a while before we started doing the general editing, um, and then. Uh, once we've begun to gather material, I began to write an introduction to volume one. This was probably before I knew that we'd got two volumes. And the reason why I wanted to write this introduction was because I realised that many people in the focusing world didn't understand that um, Gendlin's work and the uh, the steps of focusing, the whole focusing process, actually grew from uh, the client-centered therapy, from his work with Carl Rogers and a very good team of researchers who were working together in Chicago in the 1950s, and then they moved to Wisconsin at the end of the 1950s. Um, and uh, worked with schizophrenics for some years. And they were really researching um, very, very thoroughly how the therapeutic process works. Gendlin made a major contribution to this, um, to this group. And I realized that when I was writing the first introduction, which in a way was, um, meant for the focusing community, that actually there was more that I also wanted to say to the person-centered community. So uh, I decided then to write a second introduction and that introduction appears at the beginning of the um, person-centered section in volume two. Uh, it's towards the end of volume two. And what I wanted to say more about there was what exactly Gendlin's contribution to the person-centered approach has been. And it's been very, very significant because when Gendlin joined the, uh, the uh, Chicago research group, he was, a, he was a philosophy student and he was looking at the nature of experiencing and his, um, his PhD thesis was was about the nature of experiencing and it was then published in 1962 um, 
as um, experiencing and the creation of meaning. And uh, in this, he looks at the nature of experiencing and how the concepts of the person-centered, uh, sorry, of client-centered therapy don't adequately capture the nature of experiencing. And this is a gap that I had always found myself in the person-centered approach and reading Gendlin's work. And I have to say most recently reading the relevant chapter in Experiencing and the Creation of Meaning make a lot more sense of client-centered therapy, person-centered therapy than anything else has ever done. So it was really, it's, it's been quite a lifelong mission for me to um, understand all of these things and the opportunity of writing these two introductions as a result of editing these volumes has been a brilliant opportunity to bring my own understanding together. And I really hope that eventually when the volumes can get out there um, and that people can read the individual pieces that it will help the understanding of others as well. Right, it's my turn. Um... First of all, a bit of history, and then just a, a few words about the final chapter, which um, ends volume two, which is an interview um, that uh, Judy actually conducted with me. So first of all, a bit of history. Um, I'm the Emeritus Professor of Counselling at UVA. Uh, I'm also the founding director of the Centre for Counselling Studies. But I appeared, as it were, on the UEAC long before that, back in 1974, when I came to the university as the founding director of counselling. Now, that was a clinical appointment. It was not an academic appointment. Uh, but from the outset, two things I think are important about it. First of all, it was a counselling service which was dedicated entirely to um, client centre therapy. And throughout its history, in fact, that counselling service was actually um, uh, the place, I suppose, in Britain, preeminently in universities, where client-centred, person-centred work was actually, if you like, the major uh, clinical input. The other thing was that although we had no academic remit, from the outset, we were actually conducting quite a number of um, seminars, short courses and so on in human relations training and various other aspects really of what one might call therapeutic skills. And we knew from the take up really of those courses uh, that there was a very keen interest in work of that kind. So, here we had a counselling service dedicated to the person-centred approach and a counselling service which was already involved in quite a bit of training activity. Alongside this, at a national level, my friend and colleague Dave Burns, working at the University of Strathclyde in Glasgow and I, were very much involved in the establishing of an independent training unit which was called Person Centered Therapy Britain. And we knew from our experience in that context, again, that there was enormous interest nationally and beyond, in fact, the confines of the United Kingdom in the person centered approach. We had it, as you will, really, the evidence for that. And so it was that in the early 1990s, Dave and I both felt simultaneously really, that it was time that we brought person-centered training and person-centered research into the orbit of the universities. So almost simultaneously in Strathclyde and at UEA, units were established. Here it was the Center for Counseling Studies. At Strathclyde it was called the Counseling Unit. Here now were if you like, academic institutions devoted to the academic discipline of counselling and majoring in training and research. 
And so it was that in 1992, as Judy mentioned earlier on, the Centre for Counselling Studies was established here. And it has, as she has already indicated, flourished enormously, both at the training level and at the research level. And the volumes which we're celebrating today are, if you like, wonderful evidence of that. My own contribution, right at the end, is an interview with Judy, in which I actually go into some of the historical strands, but also I actually focus on my own appreciation of focusing, how it from the outset featured in the training programs of the centre, but initially only in a fairly minor way, because focusing in the 1990s was actually a very controversial business, and there were many people who felt that it was not really and truly part of the person set approach. That has changed, I'm glad to say, dramatically. I should also mention that from the outset, the courses at UEA actually majored in the spiritual dimension of human experience, and most specifically in the revelations of divine love by our own, if you like, inbuilt mystic Julian of Norwich. I think that's enough from me. Thank you, Thank you very much. Um, so we now move to Nikos, I think. I don't know if Nikos could just say a quick hello on screen. Can I say uh, hello? <laughs> okay. Thank you all for for this for for this uh, event. I am very happy to to see you all, and I I see that we have here our publisher Fedon Kidoniatis from Greece, from Eurasia Publications. So thank you, Fedon, for this. And thank you also, Esther and Mel and Renato for supporting this event. So uh, the time is uh, short, so we can move on to my pre-recorded uh, presentation, okay? Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Senses of Focusing event organized by the University of East Anglia. I am Nikolas Kipriotakis, or just Nikos, and I am very glad that you, the contributors from UK, first organized such a book launch event for Senses of Focusing. Um, thank you, Judy Moore, for what you did for us, for me, for the project, and thank you for what you are still doing. I hope we continue to collaborate in such a good manner as we did in many similar projects in the future. And uh, yes, uh, thank you also Campbell Parton for your help and Fedon Kidoniatis from Eurasia Publications uh, Athens for your trust in this project. See here you see a moment from the project's early stages. Um, also, many thanks uh, Akira Ikemi for your help and kind support. Here you see a screenshot while I was trying to make a video on, uh, of me and Ju Judy interviewing him for his contribution to Senses uh, of Focusing. So thank you, Akira. Uh, many thanks also, I need, I have to thank also uh, Anna Karali and uh, Pavlos Zaroyanis uh, from the Hellenic Focusing Center. Uh, having said that, the biggest thank you uh, needs to go to you, of course, to you all, the contributors. Um, Let's take, a f uh, let's take a look and see uh, for a few seconds uh, your names. So here are the contributors for volume one. <clears throat> yes, and here are the names of the contributors for volume two. So yes, you made this and you are, you are yes, you are the matter of and for this publication. And uh, now shall I say a few things about my chapter and introduction? I suppose I have 
to say a few things and I will do it um, in high speed, of course. Uh, I participate in both volumes and uh, let's begin with uh, the first one. Uh, here you see the cover of the, of the first volume and uh, the introduction here in, uh, is written by Judy Moore and I tell you it was a very much needed introduction with the title What is Focusing and Where Did It Come From? And of course I have already translated it in Greek. Um, yes. Here you can see the sections of, of, of this volume, volume 1, and I participate in the section 1, Focusing Reconsidered, with my chapter, which is ch chapter 5. <clears throat> the title of my chapter is Sense, No Sense, Nonsense, Paradoxes, Dialectics and Inquiry. Uh, well, uh, Judy can tell you more about my strange style of writing and as I write in the abstract, my chapter is about cutting across several lines of thought, science and sociology, from the perspective of different uh, philosophical languages, old and new, from Plato to Aristotle, uh, to modern philosophers. This chapter trusts ra randomness to comment on some of the schemas or edges of the work of Eugene uh, Gendling. Uh, the sections of the chapter are, the first one, it begins with everything, pe a personal narration, then partitioning the soul, partitioning the world, then the paradoxical nature of experiencing, the relationing, Plato's dialectic, the activity on th of thinking, the process of concept formation of making sense. Then epochi, I pronounce this in Greek, epochi and the process of becoming aware, revealing and concealing at the same time, focusing as epochi, the paradox of epochi, not just sense and no sense, but also mind of no mind. Felt bodily sensing and homeric sensing, describing, prescribing, experiencing. And the, the epilogue is the feeling of the conscious being, the hands and body mind that wrote this chapter. Um, now let's go to the second volume. Here you see you see the cover of the second volume. And here the introduction is mine with the title New Focusing Random Thoughts About Nakedness, Nonsensical and Appropriations. Um, here you see the section titles of this volume. And uh, as Judy Moore writes in this introduction to volume 2, uh, Nikos Kipriotakis ranges over diverse territory, the body, the nature of reality, language, culture, COVID-19, precarity, groundlessness, Zen, asking amongst many other questions whether focusing is radical enough today. In uh, focusing we turn our atten attention to that which, which is essentially nonsensical. In its original pre-linguistic meaning, focusing defies the quantifiable, but is it in danger of losing its radicalism through many appropriations? The argument of this introduction works both intellectually and through the felt sense, concluding that a new focusing like new physics is needed culturally and societally, publicly open against individualism or nar narcissism, a revolutionized version, 
against personal oneness, Gendlin's philosophical radicalism needs to be reaffirmed in practice. My introduction has three sections, flooding, nonsense, and a short epilogue. In the first flooding part, we see sections like bodily being, responsibility, many realities and ultimate reference, fo focusing nakedness, body, the primary schema, cultural codes, focusing makes it difficult, representa representations, a paradigm, experiential therapies, person-centered and focusing-oriented therapy, functional functioning takings of a readings of focusing, for example EFT, Greenberg's EFT, integrative integrating therapies. Now in the second part uh, with the title nonsense we see the following sec sections. I hope that you see that nonsense in, is not really nonsense. Uh, so we see sections uh, like COVID-19, precarity, becoming heterotopic and radical, towards groundlessness, the ocean of reality, representationalism, <laughs> difficult word, performativity, focusing on nonsense, epistemic reality, representationalism again, measuring probability research, unity, multiplicity, problematicity, and finally, the epilogue with the title uh, from Aristotle, De Anima, for uh, in Greek, to the zintis zosi to inestin, something like for living beings, being is life, being is living. So I think that that was all from me, and uh, thank you very much. Thank you. That was all. Very much, Nick. Also, help. Would you want to stay where you are? Let me. I'll try staying here. Yes. Okay. Um, so, so, first, many thanks to Judy and Nikos for all the work they put into producing these two volumes. I know it has been an absolutely enormous undertaking. Um, um, my, my chapter looks at Jenlin's notion of a felt sense, um, you know, a phrase that Jenlin invented in order to. To describe really what, what counseling clients do when they are trying to find the, the right words to express themselves. And because it's a phrase that didn't think exist in English before, Gender had to explain what he means by it. Um, but the explanations can become quite complicated, especially when people ask how a felt sense is different from other feelings such as emotions or tensions in the body. It's a very experienced focusing teacher, such as Anne Weiser Cornell, who sometimes suggested that it would be better not to use the phrase when teaching focusing, just to avoid running into these difficulties. It's a radical suggestion, which I wouldn't quite want to go along with. Um, and I, I, I won't try to repeat what I said in my chapter, but I do think it's important to be clear about what we are doing when we are focusing. See, otherwise, I, I think it's easy to get focusing confused with other things. I mean, for example, Gendon very often, or every so often, would complain that people confuse focusing with looking at feelings, where by feelings they mean emotions such as fear or embarrassment or emotional feelings that have no names, such as the feeling you get when someone gives you a present you don't want. Um, now, looking at feelings is clearly important in counselling, but it's not focusing. Um, my main point in my chapter is that something similar applies in connection with another group of feelings, that is, with bodily sensations, such as a sinking feeling in the stomach or tearfulness about the eyes. 
No, it's true that noticing our bodily sensations can help us in realizing what is going on in our lives. The sinking feeling and the tearfulness might make us realize how much we don't want a particular person to go away. But just being aware of bodily sensation or bodily sensations is, again, not the same as focusing. What is distinctive about focusing is that in focusing, we attend to something we can't yet put into words. It's not something that is there, um, but something that is on its way. And in attending to a situation, to all that thing, there may be various thoughts, emotions, and bodily sensations. But when we're focusing, we don't let ourselves be drawn into them. Instead, we attend to the thing as a whole and maybe gently ask one or two questions, such as, well, what's all this about? Or, what's really so bad about this? And, and then from the wider background knowledge of our situation, something may come to us, a sort of hunch or intuition, if we give it a chance. Jendon once wrote, we can think more than we can say. We can feel more than we can think. And we can live more than we can feel. Focusing is a way of allowing what lies in the background or in the wider context of our difficulty to come into focus, to come into the foreground. And then our situation feels different. And the situation that feels different is a different situation. And again, in Often does emphasize the body in focusing, but I think this may be because, well, partly because he, he wants to emphasize that in focusing we are not thinking, at least not in the sense of logical, deductive thought. But if something human doesn't belong with logical thinking or doesn't belong with mental things, so you were inclined to say, well, it must then be something in the body. But this dualistic picture of human beings that comes down to us from 17th century philosophy, gets in the way of our understanding of much of human life. It leaves out all the human things that don't fit into the body-mind dichotomy. All those things, for example, that we share with the animals, and with plants. I sometimes think that we should simply stop talking about mind and body. But these are abstract philosophical notions. I think we do much better to stick with everyday talk about people and their situations and how through focusing we can work with the situations we find ourselves in. So I would like to say don't make focusing more complicated than it actually is. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, excuse me, Brian. I'm going to stand just here. Um, I wanted to to uh, speak to you more directly because I brought some assistants here to help me introduce myself. My name's Alan Tidmarsh. Uh, I was trained in therapy and focusing here uh, by some of these people here, um, and uh, and I've worked as a focusing oriented therapist with uh, drug and alcohol clients doing a a PhD with uh, with uh, Campbell on that some time ago, and I work with clients that have uh, suffered sexualized violence. Um, my chapter uh, in in the first volume, chapter fourteen, is about focusing with elephants, um, or, or and, and and the sense was whether or not, and perhaps you'd just like to um, consider in your room, wherever you are, or here, are there elephants in the room? Um, well, I don't know about you. I see you, I see various people on the screen there looking around. I, it, you need to possibly look behind you. It <laughs> uh, may not be, 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 uh, be visible. But, but, but my chapter uh, refers to the fact that even when you don't think so, there are elephants in every room possibly. Um, my, ch my chapter was written in 2019, which seems a long time ago, and Britain at that time was 
in a state of turmoil about a thing which you may not remember now. We called it Brex Brexit, I think we called it. Um, we'd had a vote a couple of years before, or even longer, I think, which uh, which divided the nation down the the centre line, and there was a sense in the entire country that that cleft had not been resolved and maybe was not resolvable. But also I think that that difficulty was not just of our own making in our own time, but had been accumulated over many years, providing a, a, a set of difficulties which any particular government, any, any particular solution couldn't resolve. So um, I brought here a, a way to um, provide you with some indication of what the problem is. And I'm not sure whether I can even get it as far as the camera, but some of you somewhere may be able to see um, the elephants in the room. <laughs> so the sense of elephants in the room as a as a therapist, I'm used to working with individuals and assisting them to face things which they cannot face. Drug and alcohol clients have many of those. People that have been through sexualized violence have things they cannot afford to remember. And I know the power of focusing in a therapeutic sense about those personal individual things. Is it possible that focusing can be something which can be brought to bear in a broader sense about the elephants in the room of our societies, of our cultures, of our histories, and the things which even in a very practical and, and kind of vicious way divide us. My chapter um, is very straightforward. I, I devised a, a very unique and special methodology for this, which anyone that's trained in focusing will probably recognize instantly, but, 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 but mine's even more special than many might imagine. It's got three elements, one of which, uh, he says looking, looking down on his notes, one of which is pausing. Never heard of that, have you? One of which is noticing. Never heard of that, have you? The third one, though, was owning up. When I spoke at the uh, the international uh, uh, European International Focusing Conference in Greece, I spoke about uh, uh, the the concept of identlikeite, if I can pronounce it, it correctly, in the sense that in order to be all authentic, there is a need for us to own up to our situation, own up to the to the place we we find ourselves thrown into, to the place of life that we have to face. So my suggestion is that focusing begins in the normal ways, but has this turning point, maybe also associated with carrying forward, but this turning point to say, now where do I find myself with this? And what does this situation call, call me to do? What I've done in my chapter is to take five elephants, um, very obvious ones that seem to be about at the time, climate change, Brexit, um, the migrant crisis, all things that we don't have to worry about now, uh, the sense of, the, of the, uh, the numinous and one element, Black Lives Matter. Uh, just as at, at the time I was writing, uh, I was concerned about, you may, re may recall the death of, of Michael Brown at the hands of the police in, in Missouri, where, where uh, things were difficult. So in my present, in my chapter, what I've done then is to take that methodology and to, sh to show how I've worked through it. And I'm asking the readers to, to be prepared as they go to use that simple methodology and, and demonstrate the degree to which the elephants can be discerned in your own rooms. I think that's enough for me. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alan. Thank you, Alan. And so next, now we have Sarah Bradley. Do you want to wave, Sarah, to show people who you are? Yeah, hello, I'm okay. Sarah, and I've got a pre recorded.
Hi, I'm Sarah Bradley. I'm a counsellor and focusing oriented therapist. I work with adults and children. I'm also a focusing trainer, children's focusing trainer. I'm very interested um, in focusing with children. And I did my master's counselling research study at UEA on focusing with children in schools. So I've written a chapter in Senses of Focusing Volume 1 on introducing focusing to children using a story. The aim of this chapter is to demonstrate a way in which counsellors working with children in a time limited capacity can enable a child to be open about and express their difficult feelings from that very first session. Obviously, when you're working in an organisational setting with just six to eight sessions, um, time is of the essence. So the story in the chapter is a wonderful resource for enabling that process to, to happen quite quickly for optimising the therapeutic content of the sessions so that the child can get the most benefit from them. So as well as presenting the story, the chapter shows by way of a case study how the counsellor might move forward after telling the story by clearing a space and then enabling the child to explore and symbolise their felt sense on a body map. So for those of you who don't um, know or are not familiar with a body map, um, it's a, a body outline and you use symbolic objects to express feelings and the felt sense on the outline. You can add to it, you can take away, you can change it as the process moves forward. So the story itself um, is one that I've written. It's called Bear's New Friends and is animated with nesting dolls. So the nesting dolls that I use are animals. So we've got um, Bear, there's Bear, <laughs> and he's the main character. And then you've got um, his feelings inside or parts of Bear, which are angry fox, kind, curious, compassionate owl, and worried rabbit, and sad otter. So the nesting dolls are perfect for illustrating concept of um, parts of self by Anne Weiser Cornell and also self in presence, the owl. Um, and so by demonstrating the different parts inside Bear and that he can have a relationship with these parts, uh, children are much more willing to identify and acknowledge their own feeling parts, especially um, it's useful that they can identify those difficult feelings like anger, anxiety and sadness. So often children will keep those from you. They've learned that they're not okay, that they're bad, that, that there's a terrible thing inside them and they want to hide that. But with this story, they're willing um, to actually show what is there inside them. Okay, so um, the story is, is disarming and it, it models for the child that is okay to have these difficult feelings and that we can do something with them. So the first half of the story has Bear really um, not liking his feelings, rejecting them, turning away from them, um, pretending they're not there, etc. The second half of the story, with the help of our self in presence here, um, we can see then Bear turning towards his feelings, being kind, being compassionate, being curious, listening to them, understanding them, providing for their needs. So great focusing process in the story. And then once we've told the story to the child, we can move forward by um, asking the child to identify their own parts. And we can use feeling cards to help them to identify different feelings or emotions inside them, but they can obviously just you know go, go within and, and find for themselves what, what's there so these are not completely necessary but they can be helpful once a child's noticed all that is there we can do a clearing a space see which one wants attention now which one wants us to hear it and then we can go over to the body map or depending on the child's preference you might prefer to do art or sand tray or clay. There are various ways that a child can express that feeling and enable the felt sense to unfold. Okay, so um, for more information, you can just have a look in the book, in the chapter there, volume one. And uh, yeah, I hope you enjoy it. Thank you.
So, um, uh, good evening. My name is um, Anna McGee, and the chapter that um, I've contributed to these publications is chapter 20 in the second volume. So, just a word about me and my relationship to the practice of focusing. Um, I'm a psychotherapist with nearly 30 years spent in clinical practice. But I also developed in the early 2000s something of a passion for research. Um, and uh, I did a master's by research here at the UEA. And uh, for a number of years later on, I contributed to the um, teaching of research methods on the master's in counseling at the Center for Counseling Studies and focusing here. Um, so uh, then after a few years of full-time study, I was uh, awarded a PhD here in 2014. Uh, so my interest and my experiences with the application of uh, focusing and also thinking at the edge arose in the context of navigating uh, my own uh, research ethics. So about the chapter, um, I mean, I would like to say that having reread it now, I wish I'd written what I wanted to say more simply. Uh, I don't think I made it a very particularly easy read, uh, but there are uh, things in it that I really feel still very passionately about. Um, so in it, I write um, thinking about ethics and about research. Um, I write about the body as common ground pointing out that although what the body may know is um, probably indeed very culturally patterned at one level, Jendlin reminded us that every part and every system is inherently um, connected to the unfolding processes of the universe as a whole. So the knowing and the becoming of larger universal processes has its own rightness that we can align ourselves with this, to some extent at least, to the practices of focusing. So in the chapter, I also consider and write about the forms, which are, to use a Jendlin term, uh, enshrined into codes of ethics. And I turn to the philosophical roots of what uh, we might call common sense and good sense, and also right action exploring those ideas in this context of research and uh, of therapy also. So at the heart of what I was trying to convey in this chapter, I still, as I say, feel that there are things of fundamental importance and relevance to academic research and in the pursuit of ethical action uh, more generally. So as Jenlin proposed, the body's implicit and resonant knowing connects us not only across cultural borderlines, but also to the largest context of mutually ethical action or restraint regarding the environment and our collective well-being. Because ethical dilemmas are never purely theoretical, they're always situated and therefore cannot be satisfactorily resolved purely by reference to codes of ethics or conduct or practice not without including what the body knows or can come to know through a collaborative process of focusing with others who are directly involved in that situation. The practice of focusing is fully aligned also with an indigenous method of inquiry concerning what we call ethics, wherein relational accountability and its processes are the very fabric of being, of knowing and of becoming. Therefore, I suggest that the practice of focusing connects us back to our own roots and the ancient contemplative ways of determining right action in any given context. And this, I feel, could not be more vitally important than at this present time in our history. Thank you very much. Okay, so. <coughs> Hello, um, I'm Sarah Luchai and um, I have no piece of paper which I'm seriously regretting right now. Um, I have been involved with UEA for a very long time. I first, um, I first came in 1989, I was studying literature 
and I became kind of fascinated with counselling actually through um, through my through my meeting um, Maruj Torek, who was quite a, um, a kind of radical maverick kind of counsellor um, here, who actually appears in the chapter which I wrote in um, in the book. So um, I went on to become a counsellor here, and I wrote my PhD thesis um, with with Campbell here on senses of self and no self in counselling. So um, felt senses of uh, self and no self in counselling. So um, my chapter is called Focusing is Not a Thing. Um, so of course this begins from Gendlin's, um, Gendlin's initial principle that in fact nothing is a thing. Um, interaction first is, is, um, is the primary kind of, um, it's the primary principle of the process model. So actually um, the world is a massive flux of different processes. Um, inter-occurring, bashing up against each other, getting stuck, moving on, affecting each other all the way, and we are a part of, of that. That is the natural that is the natural way of things. That is um, what I think was um, the oldest name for this um, implicit intricacy of processes. It's actually the Tao. Um, the Tao is called it the Tao, but they also said anything which you call the Tao is not the Tao, because then you've made a thing. And um, so, Basically, uh, we have the impl implicit intricacy, we have the Tao, um, we, and then out of that, um, for specific purposes, we can bring out units, according to Gendlin's unit model, um, which are boundaries, uh, kind of separate units, and use them for specific purposes. So this is really useful for technology and, um, and, for, and for many things, as long as we know that they are, that they are fleeting kind of separate entities. Um, but what worries me is that focusing um, may become solidified into a thing, a, a thing like this, into a separate um, static entity. Because once you get a separate static entity that has boundaries, this is what it is, this is what it isn't, uh, people can own it, um, people can buy and sell it, people can possess it, people can compare themselves um, according to uh, trying to match up to a thing which um, doesn't really exist, it's a matter of agreement. And all this um, distracts our energy away from um, the actual the actual living um, human process that focusing is about. So for me, the, the really special thing about focusing is the way that it's on the edge between this implicit intricacy of um, living natural processes um, that we are, we are in no way actually separate from that in any meaningful way. And the, and the units, the kind of things that get thrown up um, from time to time, um, like, for example, a felt sense when we're focusing. So um, we're pausing, we're paying attention, and we're allowing that implicit intricacy to come through. Um, this involves a provisional kind of throwing up of an object, and then we use that for a purpose, which is to dissipate any stuckness and suffering that we may be going through and to, and to carry forward. Um, to carry forward, which is always a state of, of the relief of having got out of that thingness. Then we, we kind of flow along in the implicit intricacy for a little further until we hit another block and then, oh, we need to make another provisional thing. So um, this to me is a, it, it, it's amazing to have focusing as, um, as a natural procedure um, to lead us back to that natural process when we had lost our way. And I would, I would, um, I observe that we normally lose our way when we try to make um, things static and own them, control them, etc. I also think that this is a real, really big danger of our times, you know, as we're becoming data to be collected, basically, and to be bought and sold. So I think um, I would like to rescue, um, <laughs> I would like to personally rescue focusing from all, <laughs> thank you, Nicholas, from a, <laughs> <laughs> from professionalization and becoming um, becoming a thing. That's my manifesto. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Sarah. So now, now we've got Jenny White, who is um, pre-recorded. So could we, maybe we should just... Hello, everyone. Hi, Jenny. I hope you enjoy. Hi, good to see you all. Hello and welcome um, to my short introduction to my chapter in Senses of Focusing. It's entitled, um, it lulls me into a false sense of security, but I go there willingly. Music resonates with Stop Process, an IPA study into musical experiencing, unravel through music and focusing. It's um, part of Senses of Focusing, volume two, and it's chapter 12. 
Um, so about me, I um, studied on the counselling diploma um, at the UEA, and then I went on to uh, do an MA and a PhD there too. Um, both the MA and PhD were about music and focusing. Um, I'm also currently a student um, talking therapist at UEA Student Services. So my journey with focusing really began on my diploma. I was taught by Martin Langston. Um, I was also a trainee trainer on the course. Um, and my interest in music and focusing began with my own experience of working, um, working with my inner resources, working with the felt sense. And I noticed that there was a similarity between how I loved certain types of music and felt them in my body and, and how I could work with the felt sense and focusing. My MA, which looked into whether people could um, focus on music, it was called Focusing and Music, and it was supervised by Judy Moore. My PhD, um, which was supervised by Judy and um, Professor Nigel Norris, was entitled A Phenomenological Inquiry into Focusing and Music. And this, um, this particular chapter in Senses of Focusing is, is taken from elements of my thesis. It's, it's, it's uh, a small part of, of what my research discovered. Um, so the I don't know why is really key to, to my, the start of my journey and also um, like my connection to focusing and also to music and the sense of I don't know why, but I'd like to find out. Um, the title of this, um, this particular chapter, it lulls me into a false sense of security, but I go there willingly. There's actually a quotation from one of my re client research participants. They loved that piece, particular piece of music that they were drawn to and focused on in the session, but didn't know why, because it created sadness, it created links with their feelings of depression. And in fact, the paradox of this, um, of why people listen to sad music has, has troubled and baffled um, psychologists and philosophers and researchers across the ages. Um, it wouldn't, I imagine, surprise many focuses as to why two sets of different kind of felt senses can coexist. Um, and that, that has been a problem with cognitive studies and music um, that I have found. So I don't know why in the felt sense felt like a really important starting point um, for music um, focusing research. Um, and certainly music's connection to bodily experiences unite, experiencing unites both the literature that I read into in terms of research into music's effect and also the bodily experiencing that can happen with a felt sense um, in focusing. So a phenomenological inquiry into focusing music really came from the, the, my MA, which established that music could provide a felt sense that could be focused on by experienced focuses and that could yield an incredible amount of felt information and create real new knowledge about a particular problem that was brought with the piece of music. So my question research was really, what would happen if everyday music focusing was offered to therapy clients, maybe a piece of music that said something about how they were feeling right there and then? Um, there were there were manifold ethical considerations in this, which we um, Judy and and uh, and I worked meticulously to um, observe. We were commended by um, the ethics committee at the UEA, and we um, we were able to um, offer um, music and focusing to clients of the counselling service. Those sessions were transcribed and produced the data for my research. Um, these were um, analysed by, first of all, interpreted phenomenological analysis, um, which is a relatively recent um, research tool that prioritises the individuality of the researcher and also um, really follows the phenomenological tradition of exploring experience in its own terms. Um, Jen Lin was a phenomenologist and he um, uh, his sense of experiencing really informed um, informed the prioritization of, of what is actually going on for the client um, in my research. I also crossed this with Jen Lin's experiencing scale. And here um, I um, present um, the, the stages of that beginning with talking about events and going to um, experiencing sort of level seven of embarking on a process of in-depth self-understanding. The experiencing scale felt like it was really resonant with phenomenology and an IPA because it rates only what the speaker says. Um, and it's an analytical tool that could observe the ways in which participants could work with their inner experiencing, what it was that they were, were embarking on when they started to work with a felt sense. Um, so the title of the screen is Ahi Spaghetti. And that was the felt sense of 
the client who described their music as lulling them into a false sense of security, but going there willingly. Um, and she felt it in her stomach. And uh, at that point, I felt delighted. I thought, well, yay, she's got a felt sense, we can work on it. And actually what the research showed, what it demonstrated was experience focuses could, could experience that ongoing process of in-depth self-understanding that, that marked level six and seven. And client focuses really stopped at the creation of the felt sense and became stuck. Um, my client uh, just wanted the achy spaghetti to dissolve and could go no further than that. So I was stuck myself at this point as a researcher. I thought, oh my goodness, this, this isn't working for the clients. They can only get to this point. And, and, um, and I also was aware of the ethical considerations as, as uh, a researcher, my, I might have I might have found, tried to find different ways to help the client to focus. As a therapist, I just wanted to stay alongside their experiencing. And so I was left with data that showed, that demonstrated that the um, experience focus could indeed go in and work very much with their felt sense of the music and the client focus was, was stuck. Uh, in fact, um, a fellow PhD candidate um, who was in an entirely different field helped and reminded me uh, that the, the data is really there to be looked at and, and explored in different ways. And it reminded me of Carl Rogers' Facts of Friendly. The experiencing scale helped me to look at the stuckness in the client work and, and, and to notice that the I don't know became a tyranny for the client. And that some, sometimes with the clients, they wanted something to be wrong. They, they go there willingly. They want to spend time with it and don't necessarily want to unravel it. And I was reminded of um, and, and worked with Judy Moore thinking about stopped process and, and, and stuckness and the fact that that really enriched my findings with the data. Something in us wants to go there and another part knows we should not. Um, and so with the experiencing scale, with the themes emerging from IPA became a kind of an explanation for what it was about um, a felt sense of a piece of music that, that wasn't going to be able to be unraveled and explored and yet could bring so much solace that actually billions of us across the world find in music. It gives us an experiencing and provides us a kind of, a sense, I guess, a sense of a harmony with somebody who understands those kind of experiences that for a moment, for those brief few moments of the song, people listening to music can have their experiencing resonated with, acknowledged, somebody else feels it too, and not necessarily wanting to go further in it, but yet that could be enough. Focusing on it, however, could yield much, much more. For further um, insight into this, my, uh, my chapter goes into this much more, but I wanted this to be a brief introduction um, and also to thank, from the bottom of my heart, Judy and Nikos for um, inviting me to be part of this extraordinary book and to be alongside other focuses. Thank you all for carrying this forward. Thank you. Thank you, Jenny. Okay, great. So last but not least, we have uh, Stephanie Aspen, who is going to present from home. So are you there, Steph? I am here. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> technically, I'm fighting with the sun. I've got technical difficulties. Oh, I'll, there just you are. Share my, I'll just share my screen. I do apologise. Um, oh, it's disabled. Okay, I can go ahead without it. Um, so my chapter is uh, called Writing at the Edge, and, and my interest um, was looking at the role language plays in focusing. So I did a PhD with Judy uh, a few years ago, um, which looked at poetry therapy, in which, which used some of um, Gendlin's work and focusing in the context of other ideas. Um, so post-structuralism and the account of language as a chain of meaning. And I was really interested um, to see, as I say, what the role of focusing was, uh, so language was in the focusing process. So Gendlin speaks um, about the role of points, um, particularly in the, the focusing method, uh, finding a handle where you go backwards and forwards between the felt sense to find the right word. Um, but often in my experience working with clients, often the right word then becomes not quite the right word and opens onto another word. 
Um, and this made me think about the, the post-structuralist model of language, you know, in which language moves out in all directions. So in my chapter, and when Gendlin does actually write about this process uh, in tracking the felt, felt sense, he calls it explicating. And he talks about the, when the poet is stuck for words and this going backwards and forwards, um, not only to find the right word as a destination object, but to use the word to move us perhaps onto another word and another word. So we've got a parallel process going on, a dialectic between the felt sense and language. And I know that it's heresy and to talk about post-structuralism too closely um, in connection with Gendlin's work. There are tensions. Um, but when Lacan talks about the real and the way that the real rubs up against language, moves over into that space, it does make me think about Gendlin when he talks about thinking at the edge, hence the title of my chapter, um, and the way we work right at the edge of our experiencing of the felt sense to render it over into something that's more concrete. And language offers that opportunity, offers a space in which the felt sense can become manifest, but not in a static way. There's always that going backwards and forwards, which I find really fascinating. Um, and as I say, not, not to draw too, the parallels too closely, but the, the post-structuralist model of language, I think offers this um, opportunity or an explanation about how this works. So what I did was I then, so my original training is in literature. So my first um, PhD was in poetics. So I'm really interested in these mechanisms. Then I trained as a therapist, then um, continued on to do a PhD um, with Judy, a second PhD. So this sort of, I've got um, the work that I do now really sits between disciplines. So I'm really interested in both aesthetics and um, therapy and also the way in which we are really are creatures of language psychologically and the way we see that playing out and erupting in the therapy room, the way clients move through language, through images um, to construct themselves, to construct the world, to reconstruct themselves and move towards a healthier um, way of being. So what I did in my chapter, I went back to literature and I took a poem by Emily Dickinson, who's a really interesting writer, because um, she uses language in really um, interesting and, and what I'd say provisional ways. So she'll start, the poem I looked at was called The Thunderstorm, which starts with a description, quite a, I guess, prosaic description at one level of a storm hitting. Um, but then if we unpick it, we can see all sorts of connections and things going on in the background, which are pertinent to the speaker's felt sense. And we see the speakers, the, the images in the poem veer off at different angles. So a hand will become um, the, the, at the beginning of the poem, we get the image of the wind rocking the house. Um, and then we're put in mind of a hand that rocks the cradle and then the hand appears in the second chapter. So instead of using metaphor, she uses metonymy, which takes aspects of an image um, rather than the whole thing. It's a part standing for the whole. But we see how as she moves through the piece, the felt sense is traced through language by the, making these shifts. Um, and as I say, in the, the, the chapter really is, um, a discussion of Emily Dickinson as, I suppose, an exemplar of how the felt sense um, moves through language. But generally speaking, I'm really interested in the role that images play in the focusing process. Um, and I've been working with Judy, we've done further work with both visual images as well as um, linguistic images. Um, so really that, that is my chapter without notes um, <laughs> slides in a nutshell. So thank you. But I've really enjoyed the experience um, of working um, on the chapter for the book. And um, thank you again, uh, Judy and everyone. So th thank you and thank you everybody. I think that gives us such an amazing sense of what's gone into these two volumes. And I, I know we've got a lot of um, contributors to other chapters online. And I, I just hope that we'll have other <coughs> events where their work can be 
showcased in some way. Because I mean, as I just listen, I'm just blown away by the richness actually of what we have, what people have contributed. So, so we do have a short time for discussion, and um, we don't have any questions in the chat for at, me. at the moment, no. But people are welcome to switch on their microphones and uh, contribute directly if they like as well. Yeah. And um, unmute yourself and, and chat, uh, or people who look can begin the discussion as well. I'd like it off. Yes, I, I think my, my feeling, uh, listening to all these contributions, and I agree with you, I think it's an amazing richness, is of liberation. And what I experience so much in my own life at the moment is having to fight like, all the time to breathe, to really feel that it's possible to be properly alive. And what I've got from so many of these contributions was that sense of exploring, as Joseph himself often said, at the edge, and really going into depth and finding in the depth a new liberty. So I found the whole thing extraordinarily liberating. <laughs> I must say I'm, I'm amazed that we've got some some of our contributors here from Japan, and they're actually here in the middle of the night. So I mean, sure. that's a, which is amazing. That's real dedication to be here in the middle of the night. Hi, oh. hi, Salvador. You are going to speak. Yes. Uh, first of all, I, I have enjoyed very much this meeting, and I'm very lucky to be here with you listening to all of you from your experience writing your chapters uh, i i i have found very in enlivening and enriching just looking at diversity of topics which are there in the books and i feel very honored to be part of this project so i thank you uh, this opportunity for me, it has been very important to find out ways of uh, find the philosophy of the implicit and focusing in everyday life. So when I travel, when I make some decisions, when I take pictures, uh, I, I notice how different now is my experience when I am connected from my own experiencing and the way that I can share my own experiences with other people. So I was surprised that this, uh, that I could write something about these topics in these, these books. And I appreciate that very much. So thank you to, to, to everybody. Thank you. It's, it's very good to hear for you, to hear from you. And actually, I've never seen you in person before. So it's uh, lovely to see you. I just can't believe that technology's worked. <laughs> I'm just so delighted. I'm just, I'm just filled with relief at this point. So, yeah. I, I suspect the elephant is where on earth is the world going at the moment? Mm -hmm. And what are we all feeling about the things that are going on? Mm -hmm. And how are we going to somehow come through this? I suspect so, that's the yeah, that's that's <laughs> Chris, uh, oh, oh, Mary Jean Larrabee. Hi, 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 Mary Jean. Hi, I'm so glad to be able to get to this and hear all of the chapters since I don't have a, the book yet, the books, <laughs> two volumes. And um, I'd have to let all of you know that the Genlin Research Center is planning its second uh, conference, which is actually all online. And uh, I hope some of you at least pay attention to that so we can have a really rich across the world <laughs> uh, presentation on general and thought, which is what the uh, research colloquium is. And our first one was very successful. And right here, I've heard ideas from people already in the volume, probably going forward with two or three or five more research papers since, since they wrote the original. Um, so, and I have to say, I'm so grateful I was able to be included 
uh, in, in the volume, the first volume. Um, that's because I heard there was a European conference and I hadn't heard about it until after the fact. So I wrote to the organizers and I said, well, why don't you give us a chapter? We'll see if we can fit it in. <laughs> and then history took over and we got two volumes instead of one. So thank you so much to everyone who contributed and will contribute in the future to focusing. Thank you. And you can see why we needed the two volumes. You know, we just could, we couldn't have. I mean, it soon became so clear we had such a good response. We had to have two volumes, but they are. I have to say, they are. They are very heavy. Well, not every sense. Not every sense. Very beautiful too. Oh, oh, my God. Yes, they are. I mean, Gorgeous. we are, you know, fed on uh, our publisher is here. We are everybody who looks at these volumes mm. is just blown away by how beautiful they are. Mm. I mean, the, the paper is, you know, beautiful paper, beautiful font, beautiful covers. In fact, have you, have you, have you all, I mean, I'll pass this one, I'll pass them. Well, you, you all know them, but so, <laughs> I'll pass them. Oh, Steph, hi. Hi. I, I just wanted to say, you know, how lovely it is to see so much interest in, in focusing and also the person-centered approach. Since I've been working in uh, private practice the last eight months or so, I've seen so many clients that have had CBT and are looking for something different, something slower, something more grounded in their own experience. Um, so as I say, it's, it's just lovely to, to hear about people practicing, you know, from reading the book, you know, the ideas are so um, nourishing, I think is the word. Um, so yeah, it's just, just been really lovely, you know, particularly as I say, in context of my own experience with the clients that I've been working with recently. So that was it. But makes me want to say something that I I'd hoped I might have said in my little bit at the beginning. And that is when the Centre for Counselling Studies um, was inaugurated here, we had the great issue about where were we going to be housed? Who was going to afford us hospitality? And I had no doubt whatever at that point that it should be the School of Education. And the reason for that is that I've always myself felt that counselling and therapy are essentially educational activities and they're not medical activities. They're not even, in many instances, psychological activities. So it was enormously important that it was the School of Education which offers hospitality. And it was the, uh, the, the school's approach to education at that time, and also its approach, of course, to, to research, the actual research of Lawrence Stenhouse et al. Um, so I really wanted to say that, uh, especially on this particular occasion. Which was probably unusual as a, as a setup at the time, I guess. It was, it was indeed. It was innovative, it was pioneering. Yeah. I think the influence has been really reciprocal. There's been I mean, all the generation of, of PhDs that have been trained by, by yourselves within, within the school and how this has impacted on the rest of the research that we're conducting. And uh, um, I think that's, that's quite remarkable. The fact that also some even some supervisors have been able to benefit by being a second supervisor in some cases, and so it, it has permeated into uh, what we're doing elsewhere in the school in all sorts of ways. So that's wonderful to hear. Yeah, I, I, I feel it's been a really rich collaboration that we've had, you know, for, for, for nearly 30 years, which, you know, I think we've all benefited in so many ways. And, and, it, and it's, I can't tell you, for me, it's such a delight to have this occasion to be able to actually celebrate and to have something sort of brought together in a way because it feels like it, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good ending. It feels like a, the kind of ending of the celebration that we would have wished for. So I think we're very grateful. Great tribute to you too, Judy. And I think perhaps I'm in a position to be able to say that. Mm -hmm. You having succeeded me as the director of the council, so it's then succeeded me 
is the director of the Center for Capital Studies. And my goodness, in those two volumes of truth, mm -hmm. and that's that huge. Thank you very much. And I couldn't have done it without, without all the contributors. I mean, certainly without Nicholas, it would never have happened. Without you, <laughs> it would never have happened. So, it's been it's been good collaboration in all directions for a long time. So maybe we're drawing to a close now. And one thing we wanted to ask before we actually end, and we could even I've even got some wine so that we can kind of like turn it into a book launch. If you <laughs> um, we wondered whether we could take screenshots of everybody who's online. So the wonderful Renato will organise the, the um, photograph at the end. So here we are. Do we, are we one screen or are we two, two screens? Two screens. Two screens. Yeah. Okay, so we'll, we'll say goodbye and thank you all so much. It's been a lovely occasion. Really, really appreciate seeing you all here.